We have all had painful events in our lives that can lead to depression, anxiety, addiction, or broken relationships. But here's a secret. It is not about what happened to us that causes suffering. It's the stories we believe about ourselves. Join us as we shine light on how to rewrite our stories, avoid the shadows of shame, and travel along the pathway to joy, love, and connection. It's the Finding Peace Podcast with your host, Amazon best-selling author, Troy L. Love. I'm a freshman in high school, and I'm standing outside of Mr. Rice's door. Mr. Rice is the track and field coach, and I'm debating with myself whether or not I should go in. I'm terrified to be in ninth grade at this humongous high school with thousands of students. I've had people tell me horror stories about what they do to freshmen for initiation. I'm terrified that some senior is going to grab me and shove me into a bathroom and give me a swirly. I've been told not to buy any elevator tickets from any seniors because my high school is four stories high and supposedly there's an elevator that's built into the building somewhere and only the seniors know where this elevator is and they will sell you tickets to get a ride on the elevator. But the truth is there is no elevator and they're just selling you tickets to make money and I've been told about this and so I'm very suspicious about these seniors. Now it makes sense because in middle school I was bullied a lot and I know that I can run fast because I had to run away from the bullies. I can run really, really fast. So when I heard the announcement that people could try out for track and field, I thought, I probably could do that. And so here I am, standing outside of Mr. Rice's door, and I'm debating with myself about whether I should go in. Now, I didn't understand that anybody who walked through Mr. Rice's door and signed up to be on track and field would be accepted. I didn't understand how that worked because I don't know anything about sports. I've never tried out for anything in my life. And so I don't know how this works. And so I'm pretty sure that Mr. Rice is not going to pick me. I'm pretty sure that Mr. Rice is going to take one look at me, the scrawny little kid, and he's going to not see anything in me and I'm not going to be accepted on the team. And I've convinced myself of this before I ever walk into his room. And in fact, I can, I'm can i having a conversation with myself about whether or not I should go in. And I finally come to the conclusion that it's not going to work out for me. And so I walk home. I leave. I walk away from Mr. Rice's door. And I walk home. And the whole time, I'm having a conversation with myself about why it's okay that I didn't walk into Mr. Rice's room. If there is a moment in my life that I could go back and change, if I had an opportunity to jump into a time machine, a DeLorean, or some other kind of time machine and travel back in time and do something different with my life, it would be that moment. I would encourage myself to walk into that room. I would tell myself that it's going to be okay. You're not going to be rejected. You'll probably be amazing. But there is no time machine. And I don't have the ability to go back and find out what would have been different about my life if I had walked through that doorway. About a month later, I am sitting in Mrs. Wixom's class. Her room is on the same floor as Mr. Rice's, and she's my English teacher. And I'm not doing very well in English. I'm getting a C. I love reading. I could, I loved to read. It was one of the ways that I would escape. And I've already failed a couple of assignments. We've read Romeo and Juliet, and we were supposed to memorize like 30 different verses from Romeo and Juliet, and, and I think I only memorized two. I can still remember those two, but I didn't memorize the rest. And so we would have to sit with Mrs. Wixom and we'd have to pass off our memorization. And I didn't memorize any of them, so I failed that. And we were also reading A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. 
And the way that we read that was each student in the class was assigned a chapter and we had to read it out loud. Now, Mrs. Wixom had told us many, many times that this was going to be graded and if we wanted to get a good grade, we probably should practice reading the chapter out loud before we attempted it in front of the class. And she recommended that we read it a couple of times out loud before we attempted to read it in front of the class. And I chose not to listen to any of the advice that Mrs. Wixom gave me. And so I didn't read it until the day of the time that it was my turn to read the chapter. And I read it. And at the end, she gives me a critique in front of the entire class. And she tells me that I stumbled over my words, which I tend to do. Uh, I think my eyes move faster than my mouth has the capability of speaking. And so I have to enunciate a little better sometimes. And I skipped some things. And so she pretty much critiqued me and told me that I could have done better. And she asked if I had read the book beforehand out loud. And I told her no. And so I didn't get a good grade on that test. The announcements come on. She was my homeroom teacher, and so the announcements would come on during her period, and so we'd listen to whatever was going on in the school. And one morning, there was an announcement that there were going to be theater tryouts in Mrs. Henry's class. I didn't think anything of it. Why would I try out for a play? I'm not going to try out for a play. Uh, I'm not going to do any of that stuff. That's, no, I've already chosen not to go into Mr. Rice's class, why would I choose to go into Mrs. Henry's class and try out for a play that I'm probably not going to get picked for? So I had already made up my mind, sitting in Mrs. Wixom's class, that there was no way in the world that I was going to go to Mrs. Henry's class. And then Mrs. Wixom stands in front of the entire class and tells the entire class that Troy is going to go try out for the school play after school today, I look at her. I'm shocked. I'm baffled. I'm confused. What? She didn't say that everybody else should go try out for the school play. She told the class that I was going to go try out for the school play. Well, I definitely was a people pleaser. I wanted to make sure that everyone was happy with me and that nobody was angry with me. And, and so... I accepted that I was going to go try out. I mean, I thought to myself, I can't do that, but there's no way that I'm not going to do that because my teacher just told me that I'm going to do that in front of the entire class and I can't make my teacher mad because I've already made her mad already because I don't do my homework and, and I'm not doing well in this class. And so this is my one opportunity to maybe make my English teacher happy. And so I'm standing in front of Mrs. Henry's door and I'm debating about whether or not I should go in. But I have to go in now because there's an expectation. I've been told in front of everybody that I'm going to do it. And so I walk in to Mrs. Henry's class. And maybe, just maybe, I am good enough to be selected for something. I'm sharing this story with you because these two experiences have had a profound impact on my life. The one about wishing that I could go back and have a conversation with my scared self standing in front of Mr. Rice's classroom. And the second, that somebody saw something of worth in me that I didn't see myself. It's one of the therapeutic techniques that I sometimes use with clients is for them to be able to go back in time and have a conversation with their younger self and say the kind of things to the younger self that I wish that someone had said to me to encourage me to walk into Mr. Rice's room and be able to know that everything was going to be okay, that I was going to be on the team, and maybe I wouldn't have been very good at it, but it was going to be okay. I wasn't going to be rejected. And to have that confidence, and that's exactly what Mrs. Wixom did for me, a few weeks later, she saw something in me and she told the entire class that I was going to do that and it was the push that I needed to be able to walk into that room. Now my wound of rejection was pretty raw. The negative core beliefs that I had that I'm not enough and that there's something wrong with me were pretty active by that time. And so to have somebody tell me that they believed in me was 
very powerful for me. I remember asking Mrs. Wixom later why she did that. I asked her, why did you announce to the entire class that I was going to try out for the play? And she said, because you have a talent, Troy. Because I saw wonderful things in you and I wanted you to be able to grow. And I knew that you needed a little push to be able to make that happen. But I believe in you. I am so grateful for Mrs. Wixom and her belief in me. She saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And that push literally changed my life. I tried out for more school plays and I tried out for community theater after that. It was a way for me to learn more about myself. It was a way for me to make connections with people that I wouldn't have made any other way. It was a way for me to grow and develop in a way that I would not have had I think about my high school experience and the greatest joy that I had in high school was being in drama. That was my world. And having the friends and and family, it felt like, that were part of that experience for me. And I would have missed out on all of that had it not been for somebody who believed in me. So I'm sharing this with you because I think that sometimes our negative core beliefs hold us back from being able to try out new things. Our negative core beliefs convince us that there's something wrong with us, that we're not good enough, that we can't be vulnerable, that we can't try, that we just need to accept the fact that things are going to be the way that they are and not to put ourselves out there. And there's a lot of fear combined with that negative core belief that can impact us and keep us from stepping out and being vulnerable. And oftentimes it just takes one person one person in our life who believes in us, who challenges us, who encourages us to be vulnerable and put ourselves out there that helps us be able to take the step necessary to learn something new about ourselves. I believe in you. I believe that you have talents and abilities that you have not tapped into. There are things that you have the capability of doing that maybe your core beliefs and your shadows of shame have convinced you that you cannot do. I encourage you to challenge those negative core beliefs and I encourage you to challenge and become resilient to the shadows of shame so that you can start to do the things that are going to bring you greater joy, peace, love, and happiness in your life. That's the entire reason why I started this podcast and why I wrote the book Finding Peace is because I believe in you. You are a being of light. You have magnificent talents and abilities and there are things that only you are going to be able to accomplish on this planet. There are things that only you are going to be able to do to touch and influence someone's life. Just like Mrs. Wixom, she believed in me and she made a difference. And you can be that way for someone else. And hopefully, you know some people who've already been that way for you. So if you know who one of those are and you know how to get a hold of them, maybe you could send a note of thanks saying thank you for being an influence in my life. I've talked about on this podcast before the angels who have been who show up in our lives when we need them most and there are several and hopefully you can identify who some of those angels are and Mrs. Wixom was one of those for me and I'm wholeheartedly grateful for her and the courage she gave me to be able to walk through a door that I wouldn't have walked through otherwise. Now it's time for a question. I had a friend of mine ask me the other day, which wound gets activated when we're dealing with a mass shooting? Unfortunately, in our country, there have been a series of mass shootings that have happened. Catastrophes such as 9-11 and other events like that have happened more frequently over the decades. And there's a lot of pain and sorrow that happens to those. And so the question was asked, well, what wound is that? And honestly, it's a series of different wounds. It's a wound, it's a wound of loss. It's a wound of betrayal. It's a wound of abuse on a massive scale. Those traumatic events create or reopen wounds that maybe we already had before. And they're shocking in their magnitude. They are incomprehensible. And we don't really have the ability to wrap our head around 
why they happened. And we ask this question, why? Why did this happen? And that's how the negative core beliefs begin to be formulated, is by asking that question, why did this happen? And then we begin to come up with some answers that are probably not grounded in any kind of truth. It's a, probably a little bit easier not to believe that there's something wrong with me when something on a mass scale like a shooting takes place. But it is hard to be able to wrap our head around why did this happen. It creates a sense of powerlessness and creates a sense of fear and anger and sadness that if we don't have a place to be able to express, then they get bottled up and then we end up engaging in numbing behaviors as a way of coping. And so whether it is a catastrophe on a massive scale or whether it is something that happened individually, being rejected by one or two people, the wound is the same. The magnitude can make the wound more intense, but the wound is still painful regardless. And so being able to find a way to be able to express the feelings of sadness, to express the feelings of anger, express the feelings of fear with people who can be supportive and loving and kind and help us be able to challenge and rewrite the negative core messages so that we don't continue to suffer is a profoundly miraculous event. It's a profoundly miraculous gift if you can find someone who can do that for you. And whether that's a family member, a loved one, a friend, or even a therapist, being able to look at those wounds and the negative core messages and begin to rewrite them is how healing happens. So I'm hoping that if you have wounds of abandonment, loss, rejection, abuse, betrayal, any of those wounds, that you'll take some time to do some of the healing work that's necessary so that you don't have to continue to suffer because you don't need to. There is hope and there is love and there is joy and there is happiness and there is connection. And I can speak to that personally. I have been able to find people who show up in my life who've been able to help me find that joy and healing and hope. And I know that there are people out there who can do the same for you. You've been listening to the Finding Peace podcast. If we added value to your life, let us know or give us a rating. Before you go, subscribe to the show and get new episodes as soon as they are published. Thank you for spending part of your journey with us. And don't forget to grab your free copy of the Amazon best-selling book, The Art of Peace, by going to www.troyllove.com. Copyright Finding Peace Consulting.